see this? <laughs> I know, maybe just give me a thumbs up. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so the first thing I wanted to, to, to say today is just really how humbled and um, grateful I am for the work that we've been doing and just how wonderful it is to have these spaces during this time and to continue the conversations even though we can't be with one another every day. Um, as I said, you know, I'm, I'm attempting to really delve deep into a subject that is very difficult to talk about and address, uh, which is the white gaze. And so I just want to put it out there that if, if you leave this session with some understanding, but not full understanding, I just want to say that that's normal because even I, as a scholar, as a race scholar, I still struggle with the white gaze. And so it's something that we really humbly learn from scholars of color specifically as to how um, we, we use the white gaze and we begin to see it in ourselves and how we project it onto, onto other people. Um, so if you look at my screen right now, the other thing I wanted to, to mention is, you know, it is Mother's Day. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> and um, I, I, that's something else I, I just wanted to mention, you know, as a scholar, I also consider myself a mother scholar. And for those who are not familiar with the ter term, I think we can all agree that you cannot separate, even though, you know, some people say we can be objective, but we really can't when it comes to our lives and the kind of work that we do. And so I really want to validate that I am proud to be a mother scholar and that all the work that I do as a scholar influences and impacts the way I raise my daughter as a single mom. Um, and that I am extremely proud and grateful for the opportunities that I am given. But also, you know, I take a moment, not, not, I take a moment to really um, appreciate all the parents out there, all the single parents, you know, we're all working hard um, to live the best life that we can live and to teach our children um, how to be better people and um, better helpers of humanity. And so it's an honor on Mother's Day to have this, to have, to be able to, to share my knowledge and the knowledge of other scholars um, on this day. So that's just something I wanted to mention. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention before we move into um, the presentation is that this, this session is supposed to be uncomfortable and very raw. And so, if you leave the session not feeling uncomfortable, then I haven't done my job. <laughs> and so if you at any point experience any types of in emotions, unpleasantness, I want you to know that that's normal. Even as the presenter, there are certain, there's certain content that is going to make me uncomfortable. And that is, I think, why it's so important to have these conversations and, um, and so I just want to normalize that and say that this is absolutely normal um, to feel this way. So the last thing I would like to say is that you will need a paper and pen <laughs> for, the, for, for an exercise. If you want to pick up your phone and use your phone to type on it, that's fine. Um, but the exercise that we're about to do to kind of introduce the white gaze will require some quiet reflection. Um, so here we go. And I'm also, I'm going to do it as well. <clears throat> so what I would like you to do first and foremost, can everybody see the screen? Do you see, can you see, can, can someone just nod and say you see the whole screen and you don't see people's faces that I see on the screen? <laughs> you can read it all. Yeah? Okay. So the first thing I'd like you to do is to think about a time when you realized someone perceived you as something different 
than how you thought of yourself as a person. Uh, so this is the time to unmute yourself if you have a question. Um, think about a time when you realized someone perceived you as something different than how you thought of yourself as a person. So I can, I can give you an example, which is um, for me, you know, as a single mom, the way I'm often, the, the way someone reflects their perception of me is very different than how I see myself um you know on a on a day-to-day -day basis and so that would be an example you know of how what i think of myself versus what somebody else perceives me as is very different so think about a time when you realize someone and then what i would like you to do is on a piece of paper describe this experience And then I want you to think about, once the, you describe the experience, to think about how it made you feel. And then what did you do about it? I just want to mention if anybody's chatting on the chat, I can't see it because I have the screen. I can't, um, I'm having, it's, it's difficult to share my screen and also um, co uh, and also host. So if you're chatting something for me to be able to see it, I can't see it. So unmute yourself and mention it if at any point in the presentation you want to say something. If you just want to share with participants, please use the chat, but just know that I can't see it right now. Nobody's using it yet, Liz, but if I see them, I'll, I'll, if somebody does by chance and they don't say something, I'll point it out to you. Thank you. I appreciate it. So for those who are joining us, if anybody's joined us uh, in the last two minutes, please uh, look at the reflective exercise and then um, on a piece of paper, please describe the, ex the experience, how it made you feel, and then what did you do about it? Okay, I'm gonna give you like 30 seconds to wrap it up. So for the sake of time, I'm maybe going to take two or three people uh, who would like to share. I would just like to request that you keep it short and sweet. <laughs> um, so if anybody would like to share.
Anybody? I guess I can if no one else wants to do it. <laughs> Go for it, <laughs> take me. <laughs> um, when when um, I was thinking about when I started dating the person that I'm dating now, and um, during that time I was going through a lot with regard to my um, divorce and custody of my kids. And so um, he used to tell me like how basically I was really tightly wound and and it's just funny because I don't, I don't see myself that way at all. Like I see myself as really kind of messy and um, emotional and not, I mean, not exactly out of control, but certainly not, um, not particularly uptight. Mm -hmm. and, and it was, I just didn't, I don't think I even had the language to even try to explain that because like there's a whole big life that had happened before to try to understand like where I was at that particular point in time. And I just think over time, as as that stuff kind of went away, it's been possible for him to see that, like, you know, I have a pretty good sense of humor and um, I'm compassionate towards people and a whole bunch of stuff that I think at first I just looked like this really, like, really uptight person. So um, it's been an interesting journey. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That's really interesting. So so what did you do about it? So. I, I was trying to think about the answer to that because I don't think I did anything. I think it's been more a process of spending more time together and for him to see that like there are all these different parts of me. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I certainly can understand why why it seemed the way that it did at first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else would like to share? I would just say that in the um, instance that I'm thinking of, uh, I felt like I kind of was hearing Jamie say this, but it's hard to sort of separate yourself from uh, what another person is saying about you or thinking about you. You have to like really have a good, so I've struggled a lot uh, in these circumstances with um, um, standing up for myself and being able to defend myself um, and being able to know exactly who I am, uh, especially when it's someone close to you who I think doesn't see you for who you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, thanks for adding that. I think that's, that's important. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more with regards to the white gaze. Well, I, this, I just wanted to say when other people and you people i you, everybody knows who has a different opinion of them than they have of themselves and when i think about that i always feel that i am walking the path to the beloved and to the almighty i just feel that I am stronger than what people think and I do my best and so what they are thinking and or what they are doing or saying doesn't really affect me. It, I know of it and of course it's not something that one would want because it's negativity that you're thinking of but then you can change it to feel that you are on the right path and you're doing your best and you're trying to pray all the time and continue in the way that that it is set for you with love and kindness and giving and sharing and i thank everybody for sharing and i know that i'm blessed to be here Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Liz, is there still more time to share? Yeah, please share. Yes. Um, I, I wanted to share because I, I, my, you asked for our first experience, right? Any experience, but yes, oh, any. Like the first experience, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. So I was thinking back to, you know, um, being in first grade uh, in a new country. Um, 
and not knowing the language and being put in a class where you don't speak the language mm -hmm. and um and being just uh, uh one out of two people in the whole class that are uh have more color to them mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, uh the only black haired girl i was in that class and um i remember that um uh, knowing that they don't know who I am because of the way they spoke to me mm. and um, but you know it how it um, I mean a, you know a six-year-old thinks very differently than all the beautiful things that were expressed right now uh, you know turning to God and turning to prayer but I I know that from that moment on I spent uh, my whole schooling years trying to prove myself <laughs> <laughs> that I was not what they thought I was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you so much for sharing that. Can I can I um, push? Can I ask another question about your experience? May I? Um, I what, what I wanted to ask is how 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 did you do? You feel like you you succeeded in proving to them who you were. <laughs> And the reason I say this, what I would like you to maybe get at, maybe, is this idea of power. Mm -hmm, exactly, you're right. Yeah. You know, I think looking back now, uh, I don't think I proved it to them because I didn't prove it to them on a spiritual level. Mm. But I did prove it to them on a material level. I, I graduated top of my class mm -hmm. <laughs> in Germany. <Yay. laughs> wow. But I think on a spiritual level, I didn't, you know, achieve that because I wanted the power. It, would, it had become for me the same thing that they wanted over me. Right, yeah. right, right, right. And so as we reflect on these experiences, thank you so much for sharing. Um, as we reflect on these experiences and we move forward with the presentation, the one thing that I would, I would really like to emphasize is this idea of power and how these dynamics shift in inter, inter, um, interpersonal relationships, right? Because when we think about how someone perceives me, um, especially when white males are doing this exercise, right? Um, I, I think it's important for them to also reflect on where they stand when we think about race and racial positioning within within um, society and so you know your ability to do something about it in in terms of how people perceive you changes based on on where you are positioned um, in society and 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 with that comes you know frustration and anger and everything else and so um I, I wanted to start with this exercise because really the white gaze is, is this idea of, of perceiving people um, differently than how they perceive themselves. And we're gonna talk uh, more deeply about it um, in a minute. Is there anybody, for those who have just joined us, and I'm noticing there, there are a few more people joining us, uh, two things that I just wanna mention is that, um, this is going to be a raw and uncomfortable presentation. I just want to put it out there. So <laughs> for those who have joined us last minute, please be prepared that the content is not going to be easy. So um, the first thing I wanted to talk about is introduce the white gaze. And the only way I could think of doing it was to do this reflective exercise. There are many ways, right? So this is not a perfect way. And as I say, I'm very humble in my understanding and I think we all grow together. But the one thing that I wanted to start with is with, with um, when it comes about thinking about the white gaze and even some of the experiences that you shared is this idea of othering. So can just by, by a show of hands, I know I can't see everybody, but the, is everyone familiar with the word othering? Okay, so I see some, some hands. So this idea of othering is when is is when we are um sorry hold on oh i don't know why this is not working okay so this idea of othering is really when we essentially somehow make someone different 
than we are. We're putting them in a different category or in a different group. So um, I'm going to first use, and, and we use the white gaze to do that, right? So I just want everybody to understand that this presentation is focused on race. There's a lot of other ways that we can do it. There's the male gaze when it comes to sexism and, um, and, and gender. Um, there are a lot of other gazes, but we're specifically focusing on race. And so we're looking at the white gaze and how it utters other people. So um, when we think of, when we think, I, yes. Liz, I just wanted you to know somebody did, I mean, I think you're explaining it, but somebody did actually write that they didn't know what othering meant. So okay. I just wanted to tell you that. Okay, thank you, thank you. And so when we think about, when we think about othering, um, Anytime that we put ourselves in a category that is different than somebody else based on hierarchy, and I think that's an important point, right? It's not just difference, but it's difference on a hierarchy. So I'm going to use um, the example of multiculturalism uh, to, to begin this conversation. So, um, so the first thing about multiculturalism, for those who are not familiar with it, it was this movement where um, we all wanted to appreciate everybody's culture, right? So we were moving away from this idea of assimilation, that we all have to assimilate into one culture, right? So there is that movement in the United States to this idea that we want to be able to appreciate everybody's culture, okay? So from a very superficial perspective, that sounds great. Yeah, let's appreciate everybody's culture. But when we dig deep and really think about what that means, it means that some people thought that their culture was the normal one or the dominant one or the American one and then other people's culture who also lived in the United States was not the normal one. Okay, so here I go, I'm thinking about not, this idea of I'm not that. So if, so when we think about multiculturalism, what was actually happening was that even though I come from a family of immigrants who came from Western Europe, um, other people came from different countries um, around the world who weren't white, right? We all brought cultures with us, but the only cultures that we were focusing on were the non-white cultures that were different than the Western European cultures. Does everybody kind of see where I'm going with this? And so even though this idea of multiculturalism or embracing all cultures seemed wonderful, what was happening was that we were taking our white gaze and we were projecting it onto other people and othering them and othering their cultures. Because the reality is, is an Asian American is an American. Sure, ethnic, ethnically he came, he came to this country or his ancestors or she came to this country with, with, um, with a beautiful culture, but so did we, right? As, as Europeans coming from, or even when we think about um, the Italians and the Jews who merged into white culture, we all came with a culture but we weren't talking about that culture. We were just othering based on this idea of multiculturalism. Is everybody starting to kind of understand how we take the white gaze and we project it onto other people and we begin to other them? I see some head nods. <laughs> and uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna keep going with this. So the, the other example that I thought about, let me see, is this idea of minority. Okay, so I wanted to address this term because this is a term that we use a lot in our day to day, which is actually a term that is used to other, right? And it's another way in which we employ the white gaze and project it onto other people. And so um, when we think about minority, specifically in this country, the the usual the usual idea what what comes into what pops into your head when you think about the word minority can someone can anyone just throw out a couple ideas i usually hear it in the context of not meaning not white 
Okay, great. Yeah, so from a race perspective, right? Not white. Any others when we think about minority? Disadvantaged. Disadvantaged, good, that's another one. So the first thing I want to think about is when we think about these terms is one, not white means that there's white and there's non-white, right? So you're automatically uttering in that perspective. But who, who are, who's deciding? What I want us to think about is who is deciding who is a minority? Who, who came together and decided that somebody else was a minority? The federal government. <laughs> the federal government, exactly, right? So when we think about this term, we need to think about the source. Right now, white people are currently the minority in this country. I mean, I, if you look at the data, there, there are more, if you wanna call, I hate the term non-white, but if we're gonna go there, let's use it. There are more non-whites than whites in this country. So why are we still calling people of color minorities? Why are we assigning this label? Because we have the power to use the white gaze and project it and utter them in that way, right? Because we don't want them to be one of us. We don't want, we, we, we want to clearly define a boundary around what minority is. So for example, when I, when I, when I have to use a term that's equivalent to minority, rather than say minority population, I say minoritized population which I'm not even sure if this word exists yet in the dictionary, but this is what a lot of scholars are using now, which is that someone has minoritized them. They're not considered a minority, but because of the white gaze and the way we project it onto other people so that there's a difference, they are othered and therefore they are minoritized. They are considered minoritized populations. And so, you know, if you look at this picture here on the slide, when we think about minority, it's a term applied to the majority of the world's population. So when we think about colonialism and the terms that are used like savage, barbaric, these, these are all ways in which we employ the white gaze and project it onto other people to reaffirm and perpetuate dominance. I like the term uh, people of the global majority. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, Lee. <laughs> people of the global majority, yeah, exactly, yeah. And so really when we think about what I would like, if you were to get anything out of this presentation, hopefully you'll get more than just this, is to think about the terms that we use, right? And how they begin to other people. Low social economic status, for example, is another term that others, you know, we automatically get this image of who that is. Disadvantaged, we automatically get an idea of who that is. But you know, at the bottom line, I think for me, uh, uh, foundationally, the thing that bothers me the most is that we're assigning what it's kind of like a it's a um uh, what is the what is the term that i'm looking for it's it's um we're we're, we're assigning something to 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 a group or a category and demeaning them in some way in the process. It's deficit oriented is what I'm trying to get at. So another example that I wanted to bring up in terms of the white gaze and to kind of to kind of shift the conversation um, is in education we talk about the achievement gap. So let's think about this term for a second, right? This is another way that we can think about the white gaze. The achievement gap is victim focused, focuses, blames the victim, right? and is deficit, deficit oriented. And the reason why is because we're focusing one on the victim. So it's their fault that they're not achieving the way that they need to be achieving. And we need to get them to a point. We need to get them to achieve something which whiteness has not allowed them to achieve ever and will never allow them. But we're, we're, we're creating this false image that it is their fault and that they need to just you know, have access to the right stuff to be able to reach 
and reach the same level as white students, where the reality is, is that tests were created for white students and to prove that white people were more intelligent than people of color. So even the tests themselves aren't valid. And so when we think about the achievement gap, rather than using that term, which is deficit oriented and projects the white gaze onto people of color, um, what we would, the way we could turn that conversation in a different language that we could use would be the opportunity gap, right? So we're shifting achievement to opportunity. And the reason why we're using the word opportunity gap is that we're, we're shifting the conversation from deficit to systemic. What is it about the system and the way society is created that prevents everybody from accessing the opportunities that they need to be able to succeed, right? Because then it shifts it from deficit orientation and from blaming the victim to addressing the problem. And so when we think about the white gaze and as we move forward in this conversation, I want you to, I challenge you on a day-to-day -day basis to think about the vocabulary words and the terms that you use and to, and, 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 and to shift that, that conversation and say, well, what other term could I use that's not deficit oriented, that's empowering, and that really addresses the solution and the problem. So this is another example of the white gaze. Um, so I'm going to move on and I'm going to think about, I'm going to talk about the white gaze in other ways. So the next one, <laughs> which I wanted to address is this idea of white saviorism and how we use the white gaze um, from a white savior perspective. So a lot, I, I also want to emphasize that um, a lot of the stuff on the slide are excerpts from people of color and they may seem long, but the reality is, is I don't want to take their words and try to try to try to summarize them. I think it's more powerful to hear what people of color have to say about the white gaze. Um, this is from an article, and I'm not sure who wrote this article. I, I, I don't know, I don't know in terms of racially who wrote this article, but I thought it was a good depiction of what white saviorism is and how the white gaze is used to perpetuate white saviorism. So can someone volunteer to read this slide? The white gaze not only sees the world in terms of centering the experiences and desires of white people, it also automatically categorizes the colonized individual as a poor, poor thing in need of rescuing. We often find the white savior and from the comments and behaviors of adoptive parents below, it is crystal clear the black adopted child was viewed through this lens. He inspires me every single day. He has proven doctors, psychologists, and teachers wrong. His future is most definitely not bleak. He is a shining star in this world. His light shines bright on everyone on his path. People always tell us how lucky he is that we adopted him. I tell you, we most certainly are the lucky ones. Yes, indeed, he is living proof that our past does not dictate our future. His adopted parents imagined themselves as the noble and selfless white people intervening to save these downtrodden black children, plucking them from the muck and mire and elevating them to the status of real people. So I'm sorry, what? <laughs> I just can't help it, right? So when we think about when when we think about white saviorism and the ways in which we use and employ the white gaze to project this perception of who we are as white people and who we think people of color are or how we are saving them from, you know, this this terrible plight. Another example is when we think about urban urban education. So there's a lot there's a lot of critical work that happens around urban education. And one of the things that they talk about is you have all these these white, well-intentioned teachers, and let me just say this right now. 
intention, good intentions does not mean anything. And the reason why I say that is because it doesn't, it doesn't look at the impact. Just because you have good intentions does not mean you're going to have a good impact. And so intention should never even be brought into the conversation when we talk, we have conversations about race. And so when we think about urban teachers, you know, a lot of them want to come and, 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 and go teach in urban. These white, well-meaning teachers want to go and teach in urban schools where the majority of students are students of color because they want to feel good, right? They want to save the children. They want to, to help them have a better education. They want to get them out of the ghetto. All of you are very familiar with these, with these stereotypical um, discussions. And so what is happening is that you have these urban teachers or you have these adoptive parents, and I'm not saying that everybody does this. However, there's a great majority of, of people who, who take and project these ideas onto people of color and, and, and in turn makes them feel good about themselves, right? which in some ways we can talk about narcissism and how that functions with the white gaze. And I'm not going to get into that today. Um, and so this is an example of once again, how we employ the white gaze through white saviorism and project ideas onto people of color that are not real perceptions, right? And so when we think about this reflective exercise that we did at the beginning of the presentation, we're really thinking about what are these perceptions that I'm constantly projecting through my white gaze, through the way I was bred and raised onto other people that are not done, right? Does anyone wanna add anything to this white savior perspective before we move on? I don't want to add anything. I guess I, I still I still just have a question, and I think it has to do with the linguistics of the actual term white gaze, because okay. I'm understanding the concept of othering, um, you know, multiculturalism, culturalism, how we um, center whiteness. But mm -hmm. I guess it's like the it's the gaze part that I think I'm really struggling with. Okay, what what is it about it that you're struggling? Tell me a little bit more. So when I think of gaze, I think of like staring at somebody like, or, or looking at them. And so I, I don't think I understand the connection of that idea to what, what you're saying. Okay. So thank you. And I think when we read excerpts from scholars of color, it's going to become a little clearer, but I think the, the, the amount, when we think about gaze is that you're still taking whatever concept you have of that person, right? Whoever that is and you're projecting them. So think about projecting that idea onto their body, right? Through your body language, through your movements, through your facial expressions, right? So it's not just a gaze, but it's everything that you have that is projected onto somebody else and returned onto you, right? So there's this projection of who you see and then based on that perception of what you're looking at, whatever behavior is seen, you're not really seeing them. All you're seeing is a projection of your own vain imaginings, right? The things that you see, that you want to see based on the way you've been trained to see um, uh, society. So an, a, a good one, um, which I'm gonna get at in a minute, is when you're walking down the street, right? This is the typical example, and you see a black man walking down the street and the automatic reaction is for the woman to grab her purse and to start acting fearful. That is the white gaze. And the, it's the white gaze in the sense that this woman, this white woman has projected her own perceptions of what the black male body represents and then is acting according to that without ever really seeing this black person for who they are. Does that help, Jimmy? May I add something also, Liz? Yes. Um, I get an example, I think, that we see all the time of gays mm -hmm. is in the media. Like if you, um, if you want to see the impoverished people of the world, whether they're in Africa or India 
or in black communities in this country, you have a group photograph and who's in the center of that photograph offering help? It's always a white person. Mm -hmm. It's always a white person. And the, and the black people are supposed to be, oh, I'm so happy this person has come to save us. But the person, the image of the person who's always doing the help is someone who is white. And so after a while, like if you were, if, I think it, it may be good sometime to kind of, like if you were to do an exercise and you ask, uh, okay, draw a picture, you know, who's doing, who's being the most helpful, the people who are not, who are being, who are the recipients of these things. If we just openly were to do those kinds of things, inevitably based on what we see, is a white person in the middle doing the in charge of things, making the suggestions, holding the book, or whatever that thing is that they're offering, pumping the water, bringing the technology, it's always the white person. Mm -hmm. So Liz, can I, can I sort of maybe repeat back to you what I'm understanding, and then, and, then if, and then I think we should just move on, but what I'm understanding you as saying is that, that it is, it is a white person projecting onto a person of color what the white person perceives as, as that person's characteristics, which are more um, based on- uh, The white imagination. Pardon me? The, it's based on the white imagination. White imagination of what that person of color represents to the white person. Yes, and then we're also gonna get into into how that affects people of color through their writings. I'm not going to try and <laughs> paraphrase for them, but yes. Thank you. And thank Charles, you. Thank I would like you. to say something, please. Yes, yes. And Charles, thank you for, for sharing that. I think that really helped. Liz, this is Ndele. I would like to say something. Hi, um, Ndele. How are you? Hi. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not in the U.S. I'm in Africa this I time. I love how many people are everywhere in the world. Yay. Yeah, so, um, I mean, first of all, I need to thank you because as you said, it's a very uncomfortable topic and I'm sure not many people have the courage that you have to embark on it. But I think that this is what the Baha'i world needs. This is what the world needs. You know, people have to start hold, taking the bull by the horn, you know, and seeing what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, call a spade a spade. Because what, you, what, what we have just read is what has really destroyed the world. You know, sitting back here in Africa, talking about aid, I'm a humanitarian worker. I'm giving out aid to people. Uh, that's the work I'm doing. But just like Charles said, it's really the way that it is projected. It makes the, it's so, instead of helping these people to become humans and, and, and to one day stand on their feet, it demeans them, it makes them become less human and puts them in a position that they are never able to stand on their feet. So they remain beggars for the rest of their life. You know, so this is, it, it's, it's, it's a very complicated situation that you have to live and experience it in order to understand. I think what you're trying to project might help some of us, you know, to understand it better. Sometimes I'm asking questions, why not, why can't the federal government provide uh, health insurance to all the poor black people rather than waiting for a situation to happen and these people become beggars you know, depending on aid, going to stand on, on, food, on lines to, you know, receive food from food banks, why not create a situation? And this is the same kind of situation that we are facing in Africa, that, you know, it, it, it's created in a way that the continent would never come out of where it is, mm -hmm. unless mentality start to change. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing. It's great to have a voice from Africa. <laughs> I'm feeling hey. the love and the warmth. <laughs> hey, Liz, yeah. I, was, 
I was going to share is just a quick metaphor that comes to mind when I think about um, white gaze. And it's like, actually, it's like a pair of glasses mm -hmm. that has been given to us through education, socialism, you know, everything that colors how we see people, mm -hmm. and how we respond to them. So the trick is then, you know, educating yourself to remove, to not see through the, this lens. I mean, that we, we can't help but see through because of the way we've been educated, um, this, this white gaze. Uh, yeah. But we don't have to see that way. But it takes work, daily, daily, constant, all the time work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank hey, you. Liz, there are some comments in the chat. I don't know if you want, like one's a question and then one's a comment. What was the question? The question is from Reggie and it says, how can we protect our faith and programs from the white gaze? Mm, I like that. I like that question. Reggie, would it be okay if I address it? I, I address that question at the end. If I can just go through all the material, would you be comfortable with that? I don't know if you can. Hear uh, he me. says yes or in a later session. Okay, great. Um, can you somehow save that, Jamie? I don't know if we're going to lose it. But... Um, I'll do my best. I'm going to screenshot it so that I'll have it. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, so here, here we go. Um, I also wanted to talk about the white gaze and, and racial stereotyping, right, which is another way in which um, we do this. And so I found this once again online. All the resources are here. Um, <clears throat> And I would like if someone could read it. It's two slides, so maybe one person can read the first slide and the second person can read the second. I can read it. Um, an elderly man was standing at the end of the bagging area conversing with the woman checking us out. He spots our black son, looks him up and down. Man, I can tell you are going to be a baseball player when you grow up. Son pauses, tilts his head, and gives a closed mouth grin. Actually, no, baseball isn't really my thing. Man, well, I can tell you are going to be a ball player. Son, as his mom, I can tell there is a slight frustration inside of him. No, I don't even play baseball. Check out, lady. Oh, I bet you're going to be a basketball or soccer player then. Son, no, I don't play any sports. It's just not my thing. There's nothing wrong with sports or anything. I just have other interests. Check out lady in a befuddled, nearly astonished voice. What? I have never met a kid that looks like you that doesn't play sports. Man chuckling, right? Never. They all do. All right. So can we just, before we move on to the second slide, can we just unpack this just a tiny bit? I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we're running low on time. But can we just talk about what the issue here and what is, can we pull out the white gaze? What is the white gaze happening right now? So I'll just uh, say something. So the, the elderly man is actually might have good intentions. He's trying to say something nice, but he's projecting his idea that all black people to be successful, all black men to be successful, they've got to be successful in sports because that's what they shine in. So that's his attitude, if, if I'm looking at it correctly. Right, and intentions don't matter, right? When we're, ha when we're having these conversations about race, I mean, from a spiritual perspective, yes, I guess I should say that intentions do matter. But when it comes down to the impact, that there, it doesn't matter what kind of intention you have. The impact is extremely harmful. And, that's, and so I don't want to minimize this idea of intention, but I also don't want to hold it up and say, well, he had good intentions. And so regardless of impact, you know, this person's a good person. Well, that's not necessarily true, because if we really hurt somebody through this white gaze, right? And I'm gonna to get to white to policing, white right? the white gaze and, and surveillance and policing and people getting shot and killed because of this white gaze, regardless of the intention of the police officer, he just killed a valued member of a black community. And so I think we have to be very careful in the way that we use this word intention. Um, not because not because it's not important to have good intentions but because it's still important regardless of your intentions to be mindful of the way your actions 
harmfully, violently, deadly, deathly impact people's lives is, I guess, what I'm trying to say. Um, and so what's the, so the white gaze, I think mom, by the way, that's my mom. <laughs> um, so um, I, I think what you're trying to say is that the black gaze, the white gaze that is being projected onto this black person is this idea that, you know, this, this is what you are as a black male, you're going to be a sports player, right? And we all know, and we've all heard about the, the ways in which, you know, black and brown bodies are used and abused within the field of sports. Um, this is something, this is a rhetoric and a conversation and a narrative that, that, is, that is discussed. And I, w I guess what I want to highlight is this narrative that, um, once again, it's the white gaze that is being projected. Can I add to that? Yes. I just feel like there's a real like white saviorism paternalism in this like in the subtext of this conversation one like it feels like the the man and the checkout lady are trying to build up this person into that vision that they have for him mm -hmm. but also he has expressed himself and like the fact that they're not listening to him like he's an individual who's expressing his like other interests you know what i mean yeah so yeah, thank you for raising that, yeah. And I think also that um, intention and impact can be the, are the most far away from each other when the intention is thoughtless. And that's also something that is uh, in the realm of the privileged. People who don't come from that same privilege have to think about what every action they take, yes. what kind of impact it's gonna have, and the privileged don't have to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Thank you for raising that. Um, yeah, I'd like to add something, if I could. And yeah. that is, this young fellow, I don't know how old he is, the son, has basically tried to present who he is three times, and they still are not getting. He doesn't play sports at all. That's not who I am. I have a different self-concept. It's not based on sports. And I think this, this is where younger people, the younger people are when they get these kind of discounting messages and trying to redirect people into some kind of stereotypical future, it can be devastating on their own vision of a life that is well lived on their own terms. Thank you, Kathy. That's, that's a really important point as well, right? Because we, we're always, as white people, I hear this all the time. One, please tell me. Well, you know, I don't see why you can't tell me when I do something wrong. One, we know we realize that it's not our responsibility to tell us. But two, the reality is we say that, but when we, when we are told, we don't listen. <laughs> You know, and, and I think that's the irony of the way in which these dynamics work and who's in power, which is why I also was trying in that reflective exercise to talk about power, because power really does have a powerful impact on who, who's listened, who's, whose view is valued, um, etc. Um, okay, so I would like to move on, and I'm going to skip the next slide because it's just a continuation. So I want I want to I'm, I'm transitioning here to to really talking about black authors and what they have to say about the white gaze. And I just want to put it out there that um, some of it is raw, very raw. Um, all of it may not, you know, it's some of it is academic. So the the vocabulary may be a little uh, unfamiliar. And so we can kind of kind of talk about it and please feel free to ask questions. So George Yancey, if anyone is familiar with him, is a philosopher. Um, and he, of course, focuses his work on 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 the on whiteness and on race. And so this is what he has to say about um, the black body. And I'll read it. When invoking the term body, we tend to think at first of its materiality, its composition as flesh and bone, its outline and contours, 
its outgrowth of nail and hair, hair. But the body, as we well know, is never simply matter, for it is never divorced from perception and interpretation. So this was an excerpt from out of his from one of his books, and the excerpt was um, so this is actually Carla Peterson. Sorry, I forgot to mention that taken from George Yancey's book. And um, we, we don't have to talk much about it, but can someone just kind of unpack or summarize what is being said here real quick? And then we can move on. I just want to I, I just want to uh, situate this idea of body within a broader perspective when we think about space. Well, for me, it brings up this idea that, and, and, and I find myself doing it with, with lots of, of folks, is that other people are sort of a mental construct for us, right? And, and we don't often stop to think of them in terms of their wholeness, but more just um, what, we, uh, what we see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and so the next one is um, an excerpt from, um, hold on one second. I think I'm missing one. Okay, here we go. Um, so here's another excerpt by George Yancey. We're gonna go through some of his excerpts from his book, Black Bodies, White Gazes, which I highly recommend if anybody's interested in the read. Um, here he says, white sea, the black body through the medium of historically structured forms of knowledge that regard it as an object of suspicion. In other words, whiteness comes replete with its assumptions for what to expect of a black body or non-white body, how dangerous and unruly it is, how unlawful, criminal, and hypersexual it is. The discourse and comportment of whites are shaped through tacit racist scripts, calcified modes of being that enable them to sustain and perpetuate their whitely being in the world. I think what I really like about this excerpt is that it relates it back to, it, it, it relates it back to a historical structured form of knowledge. So it, it acknowledges that, you know, this white gaze is not just us today in modern society using it, but it is a historical structured form of knowledge that is passed on through our families, through our societies, right? Through the media this objectification um, of the black body with all of these and how we project the white gaze. And so that's really something that I would want you to take out of this, is this idea that this is really knowledge that is passed down, this idea of white gaze. Um, I see a chat message, but I don't know what it says. So before I move on, can someone just, uh, Jamie? Yeah, it just came up. Um... Uh, he says, subliminal response to oneness of humanity. It is difficult to transcend our innate animalistic identity. Correct. Yeah, I would agree to that. Liz, I wanted to just add that I think what's being described here is, is kind of the, the white narrative, of how we see ourselves through these uh, tacit scripts and these calcified modes that it, it's a false sense of our own reality. And I, I love that phrase, whitely being in the world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. So the next three slides is an excerpt from um, 